I tutaj wrzucimy streaming. Może um, Facebook. Niech będzie. Niech będzie. I tutaj będzie na stronie. I w tej stronie. Jest może. Możecie dać mi znać, czy, czy gdzieś się pojawiło? Tak, czy widać? Jest? Dobra. No dobrze. To dobry wieczór wszystkim jeszcze raz, tak licznie. Eee, bardzo miło mi znowu Was gościć na, na kolejnej degustacji. Tym razem degustacji poświęconej stylom Navy, eee, stylowi Navy i rumom marki Black Tot. Eee, gościmy dzisiaj eee, eee, no gościa specjalnego, Mitcha Wilsona, który jest globalnym ambasadorem tej marki. Eee, jest jednym, chyba jednym z najbardziej ulubionych ambasadorów eee, kategorii rumów na całym świecie, więc, więc za każdym razem, kiedy mam okazję się z nim spotkać, porozmawiać albo zrobić coś wspólnego, to jestem absolutnie zachwycony. Mitch jest bardzo pomocny, bardzo taki naturalny w tym wszystkim, co robi. I w zasadzie od samego początku, jak się poznaliśmy parę lat temu, od, od razu zaczęło między nami iskrzyć, że tak się wyrażę. Tak? Potem jeszcze Mitch regularnie przytacza taką sytuację sprzed trzech albo czterech lat, kiedy ja zakupiłem, wiecie, dla wygody, tak, żeby nosić sobie sample podczas festiwali, żeby nosić sobie notes i i, um, i ogólnie mieć wszystko w jednym miejscu pod ręką, to co w danym momencie potrzebuję, to kupiłem taką torbę biodrową, e, jak, mają, e, jak mają motocykliści z takim, albo jak żołnierze z takim pasem biodrowym, wiecie, taką sporą torbę biodrową. I jak Mitch to zobaczył, to tamtej pory e, nazywa mnie polską Larą Croft. <laughs> Myślę tak, już myślę, możliwe, że Mitch o tym wspomni, więc, <głos> więc mamy bekę z tego za każdym jednym razem i już od chyba dwóch czy trzech lat obiecam Miczowi, że, że jak się zobaczymy gdziekolwiek, to, 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 to muszę tą torbę ze sobą zabrać i, i się w niej pokazać, tak? więc będzie ku temu kilka okazji w tym roku, więc zobaczymy, zobaczymy, najpierw muszę ją znaleźć. E, więc e, tak, e, zacznijmy. E, e, Mitch, e, this is your turn. E, last time when we met on online tasting, it was the one of the greatest meeting I ever had. You know that? I no, told you, you many times. Uh, and many people ask me, okay, when we meet Mitch again, when we meet Mitch again. <laughs> so, so yeah, here we are. And, uh, and yeah, the power and the meeting is yours. There is everything about Navy, history, you and, uh, and the Black Dot Mark. Well, thank you very much. And thanks everyone for being here as well. Um, Just uh, to give me an idea, well, if, if anyone's not in their pajamas at home and wants to turn on their video as well so we can see your faces, that's always great. Um, but just to give me an idea, hands up if you were at the last online session that we did or if you've done one of the masterclasses before. A couple of you guys. Okay, so a lot of you are here for the, for the first time as well. Fantastic. Okay. Um, all right. Well, today we are doing a tasting that... I don't think we've ever done before. I don't think we've ever tasted every single one of these uh, rums in the lineup uh, next to each other like this. We've certainly never done it online, um, but because uh, Chris is a, a good friend and uh, and because he asked me about a million times if we could do this, then we said we, we really wanted to do something special for you guys. And um, 
Uh, it's exciting as well because uh, our importers, Peanut, uh, are actually getting all the latest releases coming in over now as well. So hopefully very soon, uh, if you do want to buy any of these, you'll be able to actually get them in Poland and obviously just let them know uh, which bottles you want so that they can make sure they put some aside for you. So, um, so today... What have we got? We're starting uh, with Blacktop Finest Caribbean, our sort of core of the range. We're then working through five years of our limited editions, our 50th anniversary into our Master Blenders Reserve 21, 22, 23, and the new one, 24. Um, I don't think anyone here would have tried 24 because even at the Rum Love Festival in Poland, uh, it, the bottles hadn't arrived yet, so we couldn't we couldn't bring any sneak previews to you there. Um, and then we're going to finish on the very historical, very famous Black Tot Last Consignment as well, which is a, a real treat. So um, to give you a bit of context then, I guess. So yesterday was Black Tot Day, as I'm sure many of you know. It was the 54th anniversary of Black Tot Day yesterday, so... 54 years ago, they ended the Navy rum ration. Um, for me, it's always, I, I don't know, it always feels like rum Christmas and especially working with <laughs> Black Tot. If you saw any of our socials yesterday, you would have seen we're just getting, every year it seems to be building and building, which is really exciting. And, uh, you know, around the world, we're gradually getting more and more people like yourselves who are fans of the brand and know what we're doing which is which is really exciting because four or five years ago I don't think anyone really had heard of Black Tart or knew very much about us unless they knew Last Consignment and the, and the very old bottlings um so yeah so we really appreciate all of you being here and uh and yeah and we've just done a 31 day tour normally from 1st of August is when I start my holidays <laughs> but again it's Chris and it's you guys so we're doing we're doing tonight as well um so I'm going to share some images with you as we go as well on this, um, just so that you can uh, follow along some little parts of it. But also today, uh, please use the chat, ask questions. If there's anything specific you want to know or uh, you want us to cover, let me know. I will do my best. I've got Google Translate open on the sides. So I'll do my best to translate any Polish across. But if you want to write it in English, I might answer you quicker. <laughs> um, and let me put this up. So, um, so some of you will have seen some of these slides before, but we've also got some new images in here as well, which I'm going to share with you today. So hopefully it will be, uh, yeah, a, an exciting little presentation for everyone. So um do, do, do. can everyone see that okay yeah perfect yep. all right great um so just to give you a little background on myself then uh so i started at this bar in london called trailer happiness uh, has anyone been to trailer happiness before if, if you haven't uh you've got to go next time you're in london please uh do whatever you can get over to notting hill right on portobello road it's one of the world's great rum bars and it was the reason why it's so special for me is it really it gave me my start in the rum industry. Um, you know, I was just a bar back. I was just learning how to make drinks at this stage and to walk into a bar like this, to have 350 rums on the back bar, to have everyone on the team so knowledgeable about rum and know everything ins and outs about every brand and every style. Um, it was really eye-opening for me because I, I grew up in a place in uh, England called Essex. It's not a very classy place. I don't recommend you go there. Um, but um, I thought rum was spiced rum or rum and coke. You know, I didn't know rum could be this amazing spirit. And when I, my first ever shift at trailer was actually doing a stock take of all 350 bottles. So the bartender would grab a bottle look at it go yeah okay there's point three left in this one point five left in this one point one left in this one actually we'll just drink that one and we did this for all 350 bottles um half of the places i'd never heard of before half of the brands i'd never seen before there were historic bottlings there before and since and it, it just got me so intrigued about what rum could be and what I found even crazier was every time I went to work at another bar after that 
no one else had a rum selection like this. In fact, normally they'd have, you know, 200 whiskeys, 100 gins, 50 vodkas, and five shitty rums in the corner. And it was never like, let's have the five best rums that money can buy. It was always, let's have the five nastiest, cheapest, rubbish rums that no one's going to want to drink neat. And so, of course, if that's if those are the only rums you have access to, you're never going to be a rum lover. You know, if if the only whiskey that people could drink was Fireball, um, you know, people wouldn't become single malt whiskey lovers. Right. It's it's that same kind of equivalent. And, you know, whiskey's had done such a great job of marketing itself and building up the prestige and building up this top shelf nature. And, uh, you know, my my sort of mission in life, other than building black tarts is just to see more rum on shelves whether it's at the bar or at a retailer or wherever it is because I think it's fantastic and if everyone knew what rum was out there they'd all be they'd all be buying it you know so so this is um so I'm actually at home for once um which is quite exciting for me I travel probably 250 to 300 days a year so anytime I get at home is is quite exciting uh so this is my home bar in Amsterdam so if you guys are ever ever in town if you want to come visit uh the bar is open just drop me a message i might not be here that's the only trouble <laughs> but if i am you're all welcome come over uh, and uh come be careful what you're saying be careful what you're saying <laughs> <laughs> yeah i need i need it started the rum has started spilling out onto the shelves and on the floors so we need we need help drinking some of it so <laughs> you guys are very welcome um but yeah, so I'm I'm based here in Amsterdam, and um, uh, you know, for the last uh, last five years, I've been with Black Top Rum. Uh, I was I started back at Trailer Happiness around twelve years ago. Um, after that, I worked in LA and in Sydney and in London again. Uh, I used to be the ambassador for uh, well, what is now Plantare Rum Plantation back in the day. Uh, I looked after them for Asia Pacific for three years. And then in 2020, I got the call to become the, the global ambassador for Black Top Rum. And I thought 2020 sounds like a great year to travel the world and, uh, <laughs> and do this role. Uh, it was not. But we built this amazing on online community and met amazing people like you guys. So, um, so what I want to cover today, obviously, I mean, like places like Trailer are, are amazing and they're, they're worth making the trip for. They're worth making the pilgrimage. Um, for me it also showed me what the fun side of rum could be like because if you look along the top of this picture you'll see uh they've painted over it now but it used to have this big copper roof along the top and what we would do on a friday saturday night if uh say if it was a little quiet we needed to get everyone going we'd grab a bottle of ray and nephew just try to see if i've got one here but ray and nephew 63 percent overproof jamaican rum we'd give ourselves a layback, light our hand on fire, and then breathe out an eight meter fireball of rum all across this roof. And the rum and the flames would hit the copper and it's all going green and blue and everyone's jumping up like, what the fuck is going on, right? It was completely illegal, right? But this was, for me, part of the fun of rum was that, you know, all these drinks would come out, they've got these amazing garnishes, everything's on fire, uh, you know, rum is, by far the most fun spirit out there but this is sometimes a blessing and a curse because when it's fun people don't always take it seriously they think it's their island drink or their holiday drink you know it's just for uh slushies and pina coladas pina coladas are amazing but knowing that you can also drink these rums neat and appreciate them is a, a different kind of level so um pour yourself some black top finest caribbean if you haven't already because this whole show gets a lot better when you've had a few rums in you um, and we'll talk a little bit about the history of rum blending as well, because this is this is a very unique thing to rum. When we talk about uh, when we talk about rum, and we talk about uh, you know Black Top Finest Caribbean being a blend of Barbados, Guyana, and Jamaican rums, this does not happen in other spirits categories. If we want to talk about whiskey. And this is a whiskey tasting. And I said, we've got some Isla Scotch, some bourbon, some Irish in here, some Japanese, all of these things. You'd be like, what are you doing? 
you know that that isn't a normal thing for whiskey if it was gin you know we wouldn't take a french gin an english gin a spanish gin and blend them all together no you just choose your botanicals at the start and you'd make your gin um you know vodka you wouldn't take a polish vodka a, i don't know who else makes vodka russian vodka a, a french vodka and blend them all together like it's not a thing that you would do with with any of these other spirits but in rum blending multiple countries together mm-hmm. It's a very normal thing. So normal that when you say it, no one even thinks twice about it. No one even, you know, considers that being a strange thing. So why is that the case? Why is rum blending so unique? So coming as a bartender, I used to think Trader Vic, Don the Beachcomber, putting three, four, five different rums in a cocktail. That's where it started. And then I found out about what the Royal Navy were doing when they were blending rum and going back 130 years before Don the Beachcomber even opened and seeing these crazy rum blends being created. By the way, I just want to check, can everyone hear me okay? Because I we've got some trams outside and <laughs> right, okay, cool, just making sure. Um, so this picture, this warehouse that you're seeing on the screen now, uh, you may be familiar with it, you may have heard of it. It's called Main Rum in Liverpool. And it's one of the world's most famous rum warehouses. If ever you've had a single cask of rum from an independent bottler, chances are it's come through this warehouse, through Liverpool. Um, They're still going today. Uh, a good friend, Ian, runs runs the warehouse there. There's two Ians that run the warehouse there. Very nice guys. Um, you may have seen this warehouse before, even if you haven't been to Liverpool. Has anyone seen the show Peaky Blinders before? Has that made it to Poland? Yeah, okay. So in Peaky Blinders, you might remember uh, Tom Hardy plays Alfie. He's in the rum cellars trying to sell the Shelby some rum and do all his deals and stuff like that. That's actually filmed in Main Rum. That's a real rum warehouse that's actually filmed here. Um, And there's a fun story because you may notice on some of the barrels, like on the one on the bottom left, there's a little label. And on that label, it will have Uh, a code and it will tell you exactly where what year the barrel is what age it is what distillery everything they need to know about that barrel to trace it right and when the film crew came in to film Peaky Blinders over the weekend they saw these labels and obviously they're too modern for the show so they went around and took every single label off all of the barrels (laughs) off the whole set (laughs) and on (laughs) <laughs> and on Monday they came in and they're like where's all the labels for the barrels and they're like oh somewhere over there and they had to go through every single barrel and work out what cask was what and you know they're, they're looking up their codes and they're, they're trying to work out where they put it all so if ever you get a, a really weird tasting single cask of rum it, it could it could be Peaky Blinders fault um so between Main Rum and ENA Skier, their sister company uh, in here in Amsterdam, um, these guys really are the sort of hubs of, of rum outside of the Caribbean. Um, a lot of rum comes through here. And this ties into the logistics of the Caribbean as a whole. You know, I think if if you're not working in rum full time, it can seem seem a little strange, but the Caribbean logistically is a is a nightmare. You know, you've got 700 different islands. Nothing runs on time in the Caribbean. You know, everything's on island time. And you're trying to get these casks of rum to different places around the world to be bottled or blended. Um, we're seeing a shift now in the Caribbean where a lot of distilleries, a lot of producers are starting to bottle more on island. But historically, this was never the case. So historically, a lot of this rum was exported to these hubs like Liverpool or Amsterdam or Scotland or Denmark or Germany. And they were then bottled and blended from those points. So we've had these sort of trade routes set up for the last two, 300 years. And some of these hubs still exist today. So how does this tie back into the Navy though? How does this talk about the different countries coming together? Um, First of all, we need to look at why the Navy we're drinking so much rum at all because this this gives you a good insight into the whole thing so this is a little uh shot of some of the crew back in the day you'll notice the person three in is holding a flagon 
This is a flagon of rum. This will come important in a minute. Um, the guy in the middle with the black book, he's writing down how much rum everyone takes. He's known as the purser on the ship or the pusser. And so pusser was kind of the, the sailor nickname for the purser because the sailors had nicknames for everyone. And so when he would give out the rum, all the sailors would call it the pusser's rum. Um, and then years later, of course, uh, about 10 years after Black Tot Day, the brand Pusser's Rum was invented because that's the nickname that all the sailors gave to the rum that they received. Um, these sailors would come and collect their rum every day uh, around, around 11 a.m., 11 a.m., 12, depending on the ship, depending on the time. Um, and this was part of the daily tradition for 239 years. Now they would get a tot, which would be about this quantity. So about 72 mils, okay? And um, this was your daily rum ration. Now you could choose as a sailor whether to take that tot as the rum or take the payment for the tot because you could take the cost price of the rum if you wanted the money instead. Now the cost price of the rum back then was not very much. And as a sailor, you only got paid once every three months. So you had the choice. Do you want some rum right now or do you want to get paid a couple of extra pennies in three months time? I'll take the rum now, right? Because rum on the ship was much more valuable as a currency. You could exchange the rum with the chef and get some more food. Uh, you know, if we were on shore leave and maybe you'd met someone and you wanted to spend a few extra hours on shore leave, you could give your tot to someone and they could cover your shift. Um, you know, you could barter with the rum and exchange it for whatever you wanted. Whereas money, yeah, who needs money on the ship? So rum was a very, very valuable thing. And the question is, why were they drinking rum in the first place at all? Well, if you go back earlier than this picture, back four or five hundred years ago, this was when the first Navy formations were, were being made and water was not safe. Four or five hundred years ago, you didn't turn on a tap and get nice, clean drinking water. You got cholera, right? OK, you got disease, you got bad. You didn't even have a tap. And the only way you could transport this water on the ships, you didn't have glass bottles. They were too expensive. You didn't have plastic containers. You had wooden barrels. Now, we think of wooden barrels today because we're rum nerds. We think of them as delicious aging devices to put our rum in and age them. That's not what barrels were four or 500 years ago. Barrels were just for transportation. They were a watertight, if you built them right, watertight thing that you could roll on a ship, roll off a ship. They would hold your meat, your fish, your sugar, your spices, your beer, your wine, your rum, your water, anything you wanted, you could put in a barrel. Okay. Ideally, you don't want to put the rum in the fish barrel because that not very good um dead bodies you know they talk about nelson's blood putting a dead body in the barrel also everything got transported in barrels right now the same qualities about wood that make a barrel so fantastic for aging a spirit you know wood will uh wood is porous wood will let the liquid in and out of the of the wood itself um, it breathes you know you can you get evaporation from the barrel every year you've all heard of angel share before or the duppy share in the caribbean because each year you're losing a, a certain amount of evaporation of alcohol and liquid from the barrel in scotland you might lose one or two percent in the caribbean you could lose anywhere from six to ten percent right so you know aging rum in the caribbean is is an expensive hobby um now the qualities of wood that make it fantastic for aging a spirit are exactly the same qualities that make it terrible for water so you've got this stagnant water in there you've got the wood interacting with it you've got this little bit of oxygen exchange over two or three days the water starts to go green you start to get algae growing in there it basically turns into a little pond and you're at sea for the next few weeks. Do you want to drink the pond water or do you want to drink the beer or something else? And we didn't know why four or five hundred years ago, we didn't know why the beer lasted longer than the water. It just did. So we started putting more beer on the ships. Wine, that lasted longer still. Spirits, they seem to last 
forever and they got better the longer we left them so it became this sort of very standard thing for any navy if you wanted to stay hydrated at sea water wasn't going to cut it you needed something that lasted a week two weeks three weeks five weeks at sea if depending on how far away that port is going to be and so depending on which country you came from that determined what your navy took so for the British, we took beer because we were beer drinkers. Four or five hundred years ago, whiskey isn't even really on the scene then, right? So gin, yes, maybe if you're the captain, you might have a bottle of gin, but not for the whole crew. So we took beer and you would have a low ABV beer for a short voyage. You'd have a high ABV beer for a longer voyage because it would last longer. Um, if you were Spanish, you could take sherry, wine, if you were Portuguese, you could take port. If you were Dutch, you could take Geneva and beer. Uh, if you were French, if you were French, you could take everything, right? You'd have cognac, armagnac, champagne, Calvados. They had the best back bar in the fleet. That's why they lost all those battles. Um, so, <laughs> so when all of these colonial powers started colonizing, they started going to the Caribbean, one of the darkest periods in human history, the question became, what are they going to drink on the way back? Because they drank everything going there. And we weren't making any of those spirits or things in the Caribbean at that time. But we were making rum. And so rum became this preferred spirit of the sailors to start drinking on their way back. And for the first couple of hundred years, rum was really regarded much higher than whiskey. You know, if you look at the old stories about uh america when george washington was going for the presidency he gave everyone rum you know it wasn't giving out whiskey it's giving everyone rum because that was considered the the best at the time um it's just really over the last couple of hundred years whiskey's done a much <laughs> much better story much better job of marketing itself um so rum started become you know really the spirit of the sea, the spirit of the Navy, the spirit of, you know, all of these, for all of the pirates and sea monsters we have on bottles now, there was a legitimate start to that. You know, it really came from these, these people that were going to the Caribbean. Now, the Navy, for the first couple of hundred years, were just drinking whatever they could get a hold of, right? It was your ship, your rules. You drank whatever you could. And... <laughs> for depending on whose ship you were on that determined how much rum you were going to drink so if we were sailing with captain chris over here we might get you know two barrels a day fantastic i'm joining his crew uh captain delfina might say well we're going to have uh three three barrels a day okay right now we're now we're joining her crew so depending you were trying to walk this line constantly between mutiny and motivation you know not too much rum that they can't do their job, but not not too little that they throw you overboard. OK, you've got to, like, get that balance just right. OK. Um, and then in 1731, we decided to write the Navy Code of Conduct. And there we actually said, OK, let's get everyone doing the same thing because we don't want everyone, every, every ship doing different things. And so in 1731, we wrote, OK, um, every sailor is entitled to either eight pints of beer per day or half a pint of overproof spirits. Now, I don't know if you've ever tried to sail a ship after half a pint of overproof rum, but it's a pretty wild time. Everyone's fighting, they're throwing each other overboard. So they quickly, they halved it and halved it again. And if you halve half a pint twice, you get an eighth of a pint or half a gill. And half a gill was the old measurement, but that would be about 72 mils today. Then 1740 comes along and there's a new admiral. There's a guy called Edward Vernon who becomes the admiral of the fleet. Now he's famous because he's got the world's first ever waterproof coat, which is new technology in 1740. Uh, for thousands of years, we just got wet. He comes along, he's like, I am dry. And the sailor said, what do you call the coat? And the coat was called a grogum coat made of mohair and silk glued together would have been really rough and so the sailors called him old grog and when he came the admiral he said right we're watering down the rum so that everyone uh, doesn't get as wasted and when he watered down the rum all the sailors went grog and grog became this term for the watered down rum 
So if you've heard of grog before, that's where it comes from, some 1740. And if you've ever had a few too many rums and you've woken up the next day feeling a bit groggy, that's where that term comes from, from too much rum, too much grog in your <laughs> uh, in your blood. So now what did this grog look like? How did they used to give this out? So on this next slide, you'll see this is a crew coming together to get their daily grog. Now that tub right at the bottom, you'll see a clearer picture in a second, is a wooden open top tub where they mix the rum and water together and they give it out to the sailors. So you see it better here, that's the open top tub there. The purser on the side with the book, he's writing down how much rum everyone gets because if you misbehaved, you would not get your rum ration. You lost the money and the rum if you were on bad behavior. So he had a note of everyone on the ship and whether you still got your rum. Um, you've got the person dishing it out. So he, what they would have is basically these kind of cups are all the way up to the size of one pint. So they could dish out the rum with different size cups, depending on how much everyone needed. And that's how they actually measured the rum ration out. You notice these guys have very big buckets. These were called fannies back in the day. And they would collect rum, not just for themselves, but for their whole crew. So, you know, say Chris would be coming and he'd be getting rum for 15, 20 of you. He would have to make sure he got the right amount of rum. If he came back short, then we'd beat him up because he didn't have enough rum for us all. OK, so it's kind of like kind of like when I gave him all the bottles for this tasting. Right. If you guys, if you guys come up short, you're going to have words with him later. Right. <laughs> Um, so this is what a more orderly crew looks like. This is this is us after a few daiquiris later on. Um, but this is what it's meant to look like when they came up for the rum ration. Now, they gave out this, this rum for 239 years. And when they stopped, the last ever day they gave out these tots was Black Top Day, the, the end of the Navy rum ration. You know, and it was called that because all of the sailors wore black armbands. They had a funeral for the rum. They tipped some rum out at sea. It was a really sad day in Navy history. But the question is, what happened to all the rum that they were giving the Navy? Now, you've, it's hard to imagine the scale of how much rum the Navy were drinking. Because at their peak, they were drinking around 18 million litres of rum per year. Um, if it was a rum brand, it would be one of the world's biggest rum brands today. Now, to make 18 million litres of rum for the whole fleet, that's not easy. Uh, there's a distillery today, if you're lucky, if, if it's really, you know, modern distillery making as much alcohol as it can, it might make four or five million litres of absolute alcohol each year, right? Like to make 18 million litres of rum, per year back in the 1800s that's very tough and what the navy started doing was they started buying rum from all these different countries all these different locations so barbados guyana jamaica trinidad and they created this giant blending system in london right on the river thames where they could blend all these rums together so this origin of being okay to blend different countries of rum together it didn't happen with you know some master blender going let's create the perfect rum blend for the fleet they just needed a ton of rum and so they would buy as much rum as they could throw it all together and it just happened over time they realized huh if we add too much jamaican rum it gets really funky and the sailors don't like it anymore so let's stop adding as much of that let's add more of this rum let's add more of this um you know, and it really was a world blend of rum. And sometimes people will say like, well, sh surely they were just buying the cheap rum for the Navy, which is true. They bought the cheap rum, which at the time was rum like Carony or Port Morant. These were the cheap rums that the Navy's bought that now we go nuts over and pay hundreds of pounds a bottle. But you've got to remember all throughout the 1800s, early 1900s, there was no multi-column stills making vodka rum you know there was no uh 96 percent abv rums being produced that were neutral it was flavorful rum it was bigger rum it was heavy rum uh you know the introduction of things like carony that that's as light as the column still rum got 
Okay, that, that was there, you know. Oh, some column still, throw that in there. Um, so this this navy blend they were creating, they started around 1804, they finished around 1970, obviously with Black Tot Day. So for 166 years, they were just topping it up. And then Black Tot Day happens. Suddenly, they've got a lot of rum left, but they've got nowhere to put it. And so they start putting it in these boxes, in these flagons. And these boxes, when you find them, they're, they're nailed shut. They're wrapped in tin. You have to crowbar them open. Uh, there's little clues on them. So when if ever, if ever you see a box or if, if ever you're lucky enough to come across one, there's clues to the box that will tell you where and when that box has been. So on the left, stamped in red, you can see Antwerp. So we know that box went to Antwerp at one point. Um, on this box, PKD 11 slash 55, so packed in November 1955. The flagons, as you can see, they're, they're covered in sawdust. That's to stop them bashing against each other to protect them during transit. And these boxes, they're designed to go one way. Once you open them up, there's stuff everywhere. There's pieces everywhere. You've got to burn it or get rid of it. So it's designed for a one-way trip. And inside, you have these flagons. So... This is a one imperial gallon or four and a half litre jar of rum. Now, you will see these flagons. Uh, they used to use them for coffee, tea, other things as well. But these are the these are the rum flagons. <laughs> so um, normally covered in wicker. Again, makes it easier to carry, protects it from bashing against each other. Underneath, it's, it's this glazed kind of stoneware. It's, it's not uh it doesn't breathe it's not like an m4 it doesn't allow oxygen exchange it's all glazed glazed tight and on top if this is still intact this is the most exciting bit for me because this will tell me where and when that flagon was bottled so you see the numbers inside 12-70 december 1970 um so that was was bottled five months after black tot day back in december now, not all of these flagons survive. Some of them leak. Some of them, yeah, just aren't airtight. I tried that one on the right. It didn't taste good. Um, you find little clues in the boxes, like these old ration cards. Uh, and it gives you an insight into how they perceive the rum, because you see at the bottom, a, a box of biscuits feeds 100 men, a jar of rum feeds 80 men. And, you know, they saw rum and biscuits as the same level of necessity of provision, just another thing that we had to feed and, and supply the sailors with. Um, this one was covered in blood. I don't know what happened to the guy who packed the box, but he managed to get the rum in there. That was the main thing. That was the important bit. Um, and then we will come back to this later, but the rum that we're going to finish with today, Black Top Last Consignment, that is the rum from those flagons in a bottle. So this isn't a recreation. This isn't a Navy style. This is the actual rum that they drank on the ships 54 years ago. So we're going to come back and look at that in a little bit more detail towards the end. Um, but we released this back in 2010. It was 3,000 bottles. And uh, nowadays it's about 1,000 euros a bottle, roughly. Um, we have about 300 left in our stock, and then it's gone. And once it's gone, that's it. We can't make it again because the distilleries don't exist anymore. The production methods don't exist anymore. It's over. Um, so if you're thinking about getting one, get one, get one soon because the price only keeps going up. Um, after 10 years of just having this rum, we thought maybe we should have a rum that doesn't cost a thousand euros. And that's when we created Black Top Finest Caribbean. So this is what we're starting with tonight just to warm up your palates you may have already drunk it that's okay if you have um but why i'm i'm very proud of this rum uh mainly because we're so transparent about everything we put in there and and this is a a theme you'll see from everything we do with black tot so we give you the full recipe um if ever we do a, a tasting different to this one i you know, I actually bring you the individual components of this rum so you can try each individual part by itself. Um, it's a blend of five-year Barbados from Foursquare, uh, unaged up to five-year from DDL in Guyana, and 5% Jamaica from Worthy Park, uh, which, you know, 
obviously an amazing distillery and delicious things there. Um, all tropically aged for the components here, all molasses based, all ex bourbon. We don't chill filter the rum, we don't add sugar to the rum. Um, so I'm gonna guess everyone's familiar with uh, the sugar part and, and the various <laughs> many conversations happening about sugar and rum. Uh, we don't add sugar just because we think it tastes great without it. We don't think it needs it on this. Um, chill filtration though, you, you might not be as familiar with, but when we distill something, um, you get oil that comes through the distillation. Uh, so not just the alcohol, but you get the congeners, you get the fatty acids, you get the esters, you get all of these little parts. And there's there's little fatty acids that come through when you distill something. Now, when you water down a rum to, say, 40%, if it gets too cold, those fatty acids will solidify in the bottle. We call it flocculation. And it's kind of like if you've ever seen olive oil when it gets too cold and you get little bits in it. Similar kind of thing will happen with alcohol. But above 46% and above, pretty much you're pretty safe that, that all of those fatty acids will stay as a liquid and you don't need to chill filter it. Why is this important? Um, sometimes you'll try a spirit or you'll taste something and you'll go, it's really thin. It disappears really quickly. There's nothing to it. And quite often that's because either they've watered it down too much for your, for your palate but also if they've chill filtered it, they've removed all the oil, they've removed all the texture, like that that fatty acid, that's flavor, that's that's what gives you body to your liquid. So when you strip that out, you're you're losing a lot of that uh, extra mouthfeel that you get with the spirit. So we, we are very against that uh, at Elixir Distillers for everything we do. We don't like to chill filter. We like to leave all of the flavor left in wherever possible. So... So that's where we're starting. That's our little warm up, warm up dram before the next six. <laughs> um, for me, this is, you know, I think this is a beautiful everyday rum. I think it's a, a great rum for your home back bars and something you can really, you know, uh, hopefully enjoy and, and use. Um, it's made up of all these different components, as say from Foursquare, DDL, Worthy Park. It gives you fruit, it gives you chocolate, it gives you a little spice from the Jamaica. Um, it's great for cocktails. One of my favorite cocktails to make with it is a jungle bird, which is rum, campari, fresh pineapple, lime. Uh, if you haven't had one of these before, you've got to make one. Just make sure that you make fresh pineapple juice. Make sure you actually like juice it fresh because otherwise the carton stuff doesn't taste as good. Um, but black top, Finest Caribbean for me works really well in drinks where you've got other heavy flavors and you need the rum to kick through. So things like a Mai Tai, things like a Pina Colada, things like um, a rum old fashioned or a right hand, like a rum Negroni, you know, those kind of drinks, other big flavors, you need the rum to shine. It does really well in that. So if you don't already have a bottle for your home bar, I highly recommend you get one or, or three. Um, so just to give you a little background as well. So Sikinda Singh in the middle here, he's the founder of Elixir Distillers, which is the, the parent company for Black Top Rum. Um, he's the one that actually discovered the original flagons and who actually sought them out. He spent two years tracking down these flagons to, to make Black Top Last Consignment. Then you have uh, on the right, our master blender, Oliver Chilton. Now, He's been working with Elixir Distillers for years. Uh, he's been blending all of the whiskies that we make at Elixir Distillers for years. So we we have a few whiskey brands called Portas Gage, Elements of Isla, Single Morts of Scotland. Um, and they're very well known in the whiskey world. Um, but in the rum world, obviously, Black Tart is our, our first rum. So it's, it's quite new to a lot of people. Um, and then you've got some guy on the left who drinks a lot of daiquiris. Uh, so this is our this is our sort of team behind the scenes putting the liquid together. Now, what we're doing today is is quite interesting because we're looking at this side by side of each year of Master Blenders, which started with this one with the 50th anniversary. So, I want to explain the concept a little bit to you about how this came about, and I highly recommend pouring yourself some 50th anniversary. 
now if you haven't already because this is super rare now uh super hard to get a hold of it's always a treat to have a bottle um weirdly uh and i don't know exactly why but in poland you basically have all of the last 50th anniversary left in the world um there's about two cases of it left uh which i saw at rum love festival um uh, if you don't buy it i will so uh actually i don't really want you to buy it because i want to go back and buy it back off them because it's impossible to find this rum in any other country now and somehow you guys still have yeah a couple of cases left um i think i think you shouldn't worry about that we will we will yeah. find the solution <laughs> for that case it's no problem <laughs> as i say if you don't buy it, it's okay, because I could do with some more bottles. <laughs> um, so this rum we brought out for the 50th anniversary of Black Tot Day back in 2020. Um, it was originally meant to be a one-off. It was never actually going to be a yearly, a yearly release. Um, but it was so popular uh, that we thought, well it would be quite fun to, to continue this idea every year. Um, and really the thinking behind this was, you know, it was the 50th anniversary of Black Tot Day. We had to make the most incredible blend of rum that we could. Like, you know, we'd, we had last consignment, okay, historical bottling of rum that we've managed to save from the 1970s. We had Finest Caribbean, which, okay, amazing. We've created a blend that, you know, we can supply year in, year out. That's a lot more affordable. But this was, this was really something special. This was a historical event, you know, the 50th anniversary of Black Tot Day. So what what do we put together? How do we create a blend that's just stunning? Um, so Oliver Chilton, our blender, started purchasing different casks and uh, really finding the best best casks that he could. Uh, because he he hadn't blended a rum like this before you know he you've got to think he's been a whiskey blender for 15 years blending rum was new to him so finest caribbean was the first rum he blended and this was the second rum he blended and this just gives you an idea of oliver's skill as a blender because you know even though he was coming from the whiskey world he he's so good with flavor and luckily you know he had free reign from Sekinda to buy whatever casks he needed for the blend. So he started selecting these amazing rums and putting them together and experimenting with them. And when he told me what the rums were that he put in, I was like, well, we've got to tell people what you've put into this blend because it's insane. And he gave me the list. I was like, well, could you put this list on the back label? You know, could you just tell people exactly what the recipe is right there on the back label? And the truth was, he wasn't sure. No one was sure in the company because in whiskey, it's forbidden. You're not allowed to put blend percentages on the bottle in whiskey. Uh, a company called Compass Box tried two years ago and they got they got told off for doing it. Uh, so they put it on their website, but they can't put it on the bottle. It's actually forbidden. Um, and part of the reason behind that is they didn't want people putting numbers on bottles that then were misleading age statements you know it's kind of like if you put 23 on a bottle and you go ah oh, what does it mean um you know putting random bottles random casks random things in the in the blend and and putting all that information on the label in whiskey they kind of stopped it but in rum there's no rule that says you can't so it actually allows us to be completely transparent with it and so for the 50th anniversary uh we put together oh it's not showing hold on my uh, my presentation is having a little little moment, uh, but we put together on the back label the full blend breakdown of everything that's in that rum, and to my knowledge, it was the first time that a rum brand had ever done it. So you get each country distillery type of still, uh, the years aged tropically, years aged continentally, and the blend percentage all on the bottom. Um, I think it's amazing. So let's drink some. Let's have a have a little taste. God, it's good. Um, I'm so upset that 
I don't have more bottles of this because I just don't, I never want to run out of this in my life. Um, so what do you have in there? You've got a blend of Demerara distillers, Foursquare, Trinidad distillers. You've got some Hampton in there. You've got some Caroni in there. Uh, you've got a 42-year-old Port Morant in there. Uh, you've got flagons of the Navy rum. This does not want to seem to, to play. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it really is. It's one of the world's most incredible rum blends in there. So the goal with this, I, I guess, was really to create, um, for me, this is probably the most classic Navy style out of all of the, the yearly releases we've done. Um, you've got those heavy Demerara notes. You've got that Caroni coming through. You've got that fruit. Um very small amount of Jamaica, you know, the, the, the Navy really didn't have a lot of Jamaica in their blends typically. And the sailors didn't like it. They found it too, too much, too aromatic. They used to say, um, so much, much, uh, more rounded Guyana, Trinidad, heavy kind of style of rum, which is more, more classic there. Um, 54.5%. So all of our yearly bottlings are always bottled at the, the same issuing strength that the Navy used to do to the to the fleet. Um, when we get the casks, you're probably in between 55%, 60%, uh, depending on how much angel share there's been over the years. Sometimes, you know, if it is a dry environment, you may have lost more water from the barrel and the ABB might, might stay quite high. But if it's in a very humid environment, which especially a lot of the uh, continental warehouses like liverpool scotland can be quite humid sometimes that's where you tend to lose a lot of alcohol from the barrels so although it's not exactly cast strength we don't we don't have to reduce it very much to get to 54.5 because with the age of some of the rums some of them are, are you know a lower abv by the time we get them as well what do you think of this one amazing yeah Delicious. <laughs> That's a compliment. Say that again, sorry, Tori. It uh, smells like a nail varnish. Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> but you like the nail varnish. <laughs> Good nail varnish. Um, so, again, I'm just checking if there's any questions or anything else but if you have any questions again please just you know raise your hand oh mitch can, i don't know if through. you know from chris but mostly uh, we as um, a set of people that are like uh, a chris people we learn to love mobile rams so the more the the, mm, the acids the everything then polish nails and, and things like that the more we will love it so i think we need to have something even more polish that in your rums tonight even <laughs> even more nail packs. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll we'll try um i guess this is this is an interesting thing right and this is something we can we can talk about because i think um i think this is a very topical thing that, that you've touched on there and it's something we have to be mindful of in the rum world i think it's something we have to look at so obviously a few years ago, everyone discovered esters and got very excited about esters. And now everyone's like, how many esters? What number is it? Yes, okay, I like this many esters, this many esters, da, 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 esters, 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 okay. But what is an ester? What are we actually talking about? What are we actually discussing here? And also, when, when, we're, talking, when we're talking about putting together a rum blend like this, the goal of... The, the advantage we have with a rum blend that you don't really have if you're doing a single cask um, and you have less options if you're working with a single distillery. When we, when we work with a rum blend, we can put any rum from anywhere in the world together and we can create balance. We can create whatever shape, whatever picture we're trying to paint with these rums, we can put it together. Now, Sometimes when we're trying, uh, you know, a, a particular rum, it, de it depends what it is, right? A, a good example was um, when the Long Pond uh, came out and uh, my friend 
here in Amsterdam. Some of you may know him, Chris von Stedink. Um, he's moved to France now, but he got a bottle of this Long Pond Tecker and he was so excited to, to open it with me and he cracked it open and he poured out this rum and he tried it. It was like, ah, oh, and he had a taste. Mmm, mmm. So when you that's, speak about this blending right now, you said a lot of blending alcohols or rums. And for me, it's like a restaurant when you as a chef can have a lot of ingredients and then you can create this meal that you would like to show to the people. So as you said, single cask or one distillery, we did this, this is our this year rums and we would like it to show it to you. And when you are a blender or you are a company that blends from a lot of different distilleries, you're able to create like Michelin stars evening and you can show us the trip like you would like to ask us and guys this is adventure come with me I would like to show you my work so thank you very much yeah no you're right and uh, I mean just coming back so when when we opened this bottle of Long Pond Teca and his first words were oh this is how all rum should be I was like what's wrong with you like <laughs> what how bad does your day need to be that you want rocket fuel to to wind down at the end you know like high ester is fantastic high ester is super interesting to taste and god knows yeah i want to taste every crazy thing that's ever come out of any distillery ever but high ester was always a blending tool it was always a way of adding a little chili to the sauce and you know as as you say in your, your cooking example i use cooking a lot as a good analogy for for when you're making a blend because you're right you know high ester is like the adding the little chili pepper now some people just like to eat chili peppers and they're really weird and uh, <laughs> they have chili eating con competitions and they want to prove who can have the craziest thing but we have that in rum as well you know we have this sort of fascination with what's the most crazy thing out there and what what are we going to try but often you have those rums you might have a dram you might have a tot of it or a little taste and you're like okay that's good i don't i don't need to have that for another another month or another three months <laughs> you know like i know i know it's extreme i know it's out there you're probably not going to sit down with your friends and pour out a bottle of it and you know have two three four measures of that that kind of rum you know it's so extreme whereas a rum like this you know yes it's going to be it's going to be a little bit softer it's not going to be crazy wit the goal isn't to challenge you in that way the goal is to give you complexity of flavor the goal is to give you something hopefully beautifully put together that you like and as you see with each round of these rums tonight you're going to see different expressions and different ways in which we've done that um but let's have a little look at esters for a second because i think it is i think it is an important thing to to dig into because a lot of people talk about esters, not a lot of people know what esters are and know how esters are formed. So let's just let's just geek out on this for a second just to sort of put this into context. So first of all, very simply, outside of a number, what is an ester? Esters are usually the fruit smells in your spirits. So when you smell, you know, a Hampton and you get that pineapple smell, or you smell Worthy Park and you get that banana smell, or you smell Savannah ATRR and you get that strawberry bubblegum smell, you know, these are esters that come from the, the production of these rums and these distilleries and certain fermentations, certain methods will give you a higher proportion of a certain ester. But in general, what we're really saying is if you like rum with lots of esters, you like fruity rum. That's what you're saying, okay? Yes, there are esters that are going to give you more those burnt rubber and acetone flavors as well. But really, we're talking about the fruit smells most of the time. Now, how do we make an ester? How is this formed? So esters are essentially when you take an acid molecule and an alcohol molecule, okay? And they love each other very much. They come together and they make a little ester baby, okay? Now, depending on the type of acid and the type of alcohol, they're going to come together and make all different types of ester babies. Okay. So what do ester babies look like? Ester babies look like this. So this is all the different types of esters that we can make. Now, along the top, you've got all the different types of alcohol and the bottom on the side, 
got all the different types of acids, okay, specifically carboxylic acids, which, uh, yeah, add another layer of complication to it, but don't worry too much. Now, notice all the alcohols along the top. This has to happen predominantly in fermentation. Why? Because after distillation, you've removed all the other alcohols other than ethanol. Why there is Bacardi? Just don't worry too much. I can I can see why you didn't want to give them because the mic. It, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I will I will say I stole this Esther table off the internet. This is some scientist guy who just geeks out about esters. So, um, now you've got all these different types of alcohol on the top. After distillation, the only alcohol you want to have in any significant amount is ethanol. But in fermentation, you can have methanol, you can have these other types of alcohol, and that allows you more different types of alcohol to make more different types of ester. Down the side, you've got the different acids. Now, the only ester that we ever measure for the purpose of ester numbers is the one two in, two down, ethyl ethanoate, usually known as ethyl acetate. Why do we measure that one? Because that one's always there. Okay, ethanol plus acetic acid, vinegar, essentially, you're always going to have ethanol because you need that to distill and, and make your alcohol at the end. And the ethanoate, the acetic acid, if you have any acidity at all, it's going to come from there and you're going to be able to measure that ester. So that's a very easy ester for them to measure. It's also one of the most abundant esters. It's one of the easiest to form. So if we're going to use any ester as a measuring stick, ethyl acetate makes, a, a, makes sense to use that one. Now, as you can see from the chart, that one basically smells like glue. So that's not the exciting one flavor-wise, okay? The exciting ones are the pineapples, the bananas, the blackberries, strawberries, esters, all coconuts, mint, all these other flavors going on, right? But the one we measure is ethyl ethanoate, which by itself is not exciting. So... When we talk about numbers of esters, when I say, you know, a rum has 200 esters, I'm not saying it has 200 different types of these esters. I'm saying it's got 200 grams of ethyl ethanoate per 100 liters of absolute alcohol. What does that mean? So if I had 100 liters of this alcohol at 100% ABB, which is theoretically impossible, I evaporated everything else off except for the ethyl ethanoate. I'd have 200 grams left. What does that mean? Absolutely nothing. It's just a number. It doesn't tell you anything about flavor. It doesn't tell you anything about the other flavors going on. It's just a number. Now, why has it become famous? Because in Jamaica, Jamaica is famous for making esters by different marks, by different ester levels. Now, they can go from zero to 1600 esters. They can make higher, but legally they're not allowed to export any higher. 1600 is the cap. So anywhere from zero to 1600, that's their range. Now in Guyana, you've got a high ester still that makes 3000 plus ester rum. Okay. You can make much higher, but again, where are you going to use it? Where is it going to be useful for? So when we're measuring the number of esters, the number doesn't really tell you everything. What you're looking for is really what type of esters, what type of flavor compounds are you making? Is there banana in there? Is there pineapple in there? Is there strawberry? Is there mint? Talk about the flavor more than the number. The reason why people get so excited about a high number is because hopefully if it's got lots of ethyl acetate, chances are it might have lots of the other flavors as well. Okay. But just drinking the highest number is like, it's like having the hottest curry at the Indian restaurant. You know, I just want the spiciest thing. Well, what do you want to taste? What flavors do you like? It doesn't matter. I just want the most intense, you know? Um, it's like if I asked you what kind of music do you like and you said, I like loud music. Okay, but is that rock and roll? Is it country? Is it hip hop? Is it soul? What, what, what kind of music do you like? That's more important than just knowing the intensity. But it happens with everything. It happened in whiskey. You know, the whiskey guys when they discovered PPM on uh, Isla Whiskies. Uh, a few years ago, a brand called Octomore came out and they started putting PPM numbers on the bottles, which was parts per million. And it was a way of measuring the phenol compounds, the smoke of the barley 
pre-fermentation, pre-distillation, pre-aging had no relation to what was in the glass, but you put a number on it, everyone wants to try the highest. So suddenly you get these whiskey nerds being like, how many PPM is this? And you'd be like, oh, like 30 PPM. They'd be like, ha oh, children's whiskey, throw it away. You know, unless it, unless I'm physically choking on the whiskey, it's not enough. Um, you get the beer nerds, you know, is, are there any craft beer nerds here? You can never tell. Sometimes they, they might be here right in this room, but you meet a craft beer nerd and you ask them, you know, do you want to have a beer? And they're like, not that beer. And they open up their quadruple IPA, you know, mega hop, uh, ultra thing, and and they pour it out. There's no, there's no actual liquid in there. I mean, it's just like I spent hops ten years and dust. with beers, and they can actually understand everything. Like what with different or weird type of hop we will get. So, oh, Australia, oh, we have hops. Okay, then America, what types of hops? How much a hop rate can be inside? If it can be like cryo hops or cryo hops and everything or like double dry hop, everything. We, we got everything from like regular IPA to like seven different names before the IPA name and the price is going high and we just need to try it because we go to the wall and nothing will have, make us happy. So yeah, you have a point, like a really great point. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so. And uh, you summoned him. <laughs> so this is something you know the reason why i talk about this and why we go on this thing is like there there is a a journey that every one of you will go through with your with your rum depending on how many years into this you all are where when you start most people like sweet stuff when they start then they sort of get into it and then they might try a little bit higher abv and they might get a little bit drier with their palates and over enough time, your the level of sweetness you like goes tends to go down. The level of ABV you like tends to go up. And you end up at this point where you like start liking such extreme rums. It's like, again, with the food, like if you're having the spiciest dish at the Indian restaurant, that anything less than that then tastes bland and you don't appreciate it and you just go, oh, it's rubbish. And you'll get these people being like, oh, Oh, it's only 50% ABV? <laughs> Ridiculous. Children's rum, you know? Like, no. <laughs> Stop, right? Just because you've got so used to extreme flavors that you can't taste anything lower anymore, you, you need to train your palate to actually be able to taste at all different ABVs and all different styles because I'm, I'm telling you, like, you turn up somewhere and you're trying to get your friends to drink rum, you're pouring you know, an 85% ABV Montebello from Guadeloupe because that's the new thing that you've you've discovered is super high ABV. You've got to find different levels of rum and different situations for your palates. So, you know, this, this for most people here will be pretty light, pretty balanced, okay? Maybe not light because it's quite flavorful, but pretty balanced. It's not the highest ABV. It's not going to be 60, 70% or anything crazy. Um, but to a, a, a new person to run, this would be quite challenging. Still 54.5%. It's like, that's quite quite a step up for a lot of people. So, so yeah. So I guess the the sort of sideline to all of that is is always keep an open mind. And if you if you find your palate isn't able to pick up flavors anymore, it might be that the rum's very neutral. That's a thing too. But it might also be that you've just got so used to extreme flavors that you need to need to just try some other things out and it's not always the most extreme is the best sometimes balance is a really good thing as well mm. that said let's pour our 2021 because this one does go a little higher SP. it is a little funkier and i'd say it's probably the funkiest of all the rums that we ever released so um in terms of our master blender series so in the 2021, we start to get a bit more. Uh, we put some Australian rum in there. There's some Beanley in there, some 14 year, which is delicious. Got a lot more Trinidad rum in this one. It's a heavier proportion of the Trinidad. Got some Hampton. And the goal with this was to let some of those fruitier, funkier flavors come through and shine through a little bit more. So it's a, 
it is a little little funkier for those of you who like that style you can smell straight away on the nose you know it's a slightly higher ester slightly brasher style of rum whereas if you um by the way i don't know what your glass situation is at home but if you're able to set up your rums try not to down each rum <laughs> entirely if you can uh i know Wait. We're, i know we're in poland and i know it's not moderation isn't in your nature sometimes but if you if you have enough glasses it's too good to... it's too good but the, the reason why i say it is because with blends like this there's so many layers in it that if you try them and then you go back to some of the earlier ones you're going to start picking up different notes in year to year and it will give you a a way of comparing them side by side so uh, you know drink it how you like it obviously but i would recommend if you want to get the most from tonight try each rum go back compare go back after the third or fourth rum go back and compare again and that's where you're going to really start to pick up all the differences exactly exactly like i like i told you uh, earlier that this is the uh the most the most important to compare them together in the same time so so if you if you can do that so so 2021 um i'll tell you a little bit about how this all came about as well because it's quite a fun fun little story um so i i said 2020 was meant to be originally uh just a one-off blend we weren't meant to be doing it every year um and part of what happened was when we blended the 50th anniversary, it was uh, it was March 2020. So it was uh, just coming up to um, coronavirus times, okay, just coming up to this time. And when we were blending and bottling, we weren't allowed to go to the blending hall. We weren't allowed to actually go and visit these places. So normally, and we're a small company, so it's not like we have our own bottling hall or um, huge blending bats or anything else. We we use a third party because, you know, we're a small company. And so we would hire out blending vats or we'd hire out a bottling hall for a day and they'd, they'd make our rum. Now, when you're blending rums like 42-year-old Port Morant, 23-year-old Coroni, Flagons of Navy rum, you want to make sure they don't make any mistakes. However, March 2020, we weren't allowed to travel or visit. So we sent them the recipe and we sent them these, these blend percentages that you're seeing here. And we said, okay, uh, this is what we want to make. They sent us back a sample of the 50th anniversary. We tried it and all we could taste was Hampton. We're like, that's really strange. Why is it just taste of Hampton? And we went back to them and we said, just double checking that Hampton we gave you, you did just put... Uh, a third of the cask in right and they said oh we thought you said three casks now if you can imagine out of all of the components that you could add perhaps too much of mm -hmm. hampton being the most extreme like if you were cooking and the lid of your chili came off and now the whole thing tastes of chili so this whole blend now tasted of hampton we then started panic calling everyone we could being like have you got more casks of this one of this one and they're like, oh, we do, but we've already promised to sell them to these guys. And we're like, please, can you sell them to us? And they said, okay, right. If if they don't pay on time, you can have the casks. And luckily it's rum, so no one pays anything on time. So we get these extra casks. We're able to add more rum to the blend to balance out the 50th anniversary. But then we had it ended up with a third extra rum. Now... When I first started with Black Tart, I was like, could we rebuild the blending vats and do something like we they used to do back in the day? And our blender, Ollie, just looked at me like, what the hell are you talking about? No, you can't build open top vats of rum evaporating off 10% per year. That would be crazy. Um, but when this happened, we ended up with this third extra rum and Ollie called me and said, okay, what we're going to do is take that extra third. We're going to put it in sherry casks for nine months. And then that will become the base for 2021. So when you look at the recipe on 2021, you'll see 50th anniversary is one of the lines. Then we add all of the other casks on top. 
and this began this happy accident began what then became the master blenders reserve series so every year we take a little bit of last year's blend we put it into sherry casks and then that becomes the base for the next year's blend so 2021 has a little bit of 50th in there but this year we went beanley hampton old trinidad rum really leaned into that fruitier funkier style of rum and the bean leaf for me gives it this lovely little it's always this sort of eucalyptus like slightly menthol citrusy kind of note that you get on being old bean leaves which is stunning and lovely um and so it was really nice to have that in the blend as well because australian rum would have been in the blend at some points as well so uh historically it kind of makes sense as well what do you think of the 2021 who likes this one Good, like tasty. More yeah. esters, more esters we like. Yeah. More esters, more spice, more intensity, yes. <laughs> if, I may, if I may get back to, to the previous one, because this one is indeed nice because of the more esters and it's much more spicy. But as you mentioned, uh, I wouldn't disappreciate the previous one because it doesn't have esters, right? Because of the round. I come from the whiskey also and uh, you know, everyone is, as you said, crazy about Isla. Uh, all my yes. colleagues the club, uh, and I'm quite tired usually about it, right? Because <laughs> they only want to eat whiskey, and I really appreciate that you have something so balanced and, and round and uh, really nice. But this one, uh, I don't know what was the percentage of the Van Lee because I can really smell it much here. Uh, so the Bean Lee is on this one. This is a great thing about having it on all the bottles. 6.7%. Okay. So, again, these are... Think of blending as cooking again, you know? When you're cooking, you might love adding a bit of salt or adding a bit of chili or adding a bit of garlic. But the total percentage of those flavors compared to the rest of the ingredients might be half a percent one percent two percent you know like these very intense uh additions to your dish can complete if you add too much salt the whole dish is ruined right you add too much chili it's too spicy for some people right so when you're blending sometimes we look at the number we go oh it's only six percent it's only seven percent it's only five percent whatever it is and it can sound very low but you've got to think the more intense the rum the less you need and Blending is all about getting that balance and getting that harmony between all those flavors to come together. So, you know, it's, it's a, again, it's a funny thing. It's funny when you see the numbers because you know, that's only a little bit, but a little bit can go a long way depending on what that flavor is. So, but um, the 2021 is definitely a favorite with a lot of people and a lot of people, especially if you do like, higher ester style rums i think 21 is an absolute must to go for uh again poland one of the few places where you can still get 2021 uh, so <laughs> you guys if you like that one go for it <laughs> you're gonna be very happy now let's now add and again ideally if you've got enough tasting glasses Keep adding to the, the glasses so you can try these side by side or at least leave a couple up so that you can try some of them side by side. It's, uh, it'll really help. And now we're going to go to 2022. Pour yourself some of this one. So now from this stage, now the if you thought the blends were complex before, now we're about to go to a whole different level of complexity because this is starting to get really out there now so in 2022 ollie kind of changed his blending method slightly um and the reason was he was actually going to create uh originally a very jamaica heavy blend um and he started experimenting with some casks and putting together his perfect jamaica blend like if, if you could take any casks at all put them together what would you make so he made this Jamaica blend Um, the rums he used in it were so old and so rare that we would have only had about 400 bottles 
and it would have cost about six, 700 euros a bottle. <laughs> so it was really expensive rum. Um, we said, okay, well, let's not do that. Um, but now he had this very complex Jamaica blend. So then he went, okay, well, let's, let's create my perfect Barbados blend, my perfect Guyana blend, my perfect Trinidad blend, and then blend those together. And this created 2022 and it, led to this kind of blend breakdown so you'll notice if you if you do have the bottles at home or if you're getting hold of them the the label changes slightly on the back this year because unlike in the previous years where we could fit every single cask on now we had 20 different casks in the blend so we give you a country summary with the country different years the blend percentage but on the website and here you can see every single cask that's in that blend. So you've got 30 year old Demerara, 18 year Demerara, uh, some younger ones as well, some two and some seven in there as well. Uh, some 19 year Barbados, 16 year Barbados, um, you know, a 19 year Mount Gay, which in itself is fantastic and very rare. Uh, the Jamaica, New Yarmouth, Clarendon, Long Pond all coming together. You know, the youngest rum in the Jamaica component is about 22 years, going up to 27 years. Uh, the Trinidad, you've got some 24-year-old Carony in there. You've got a whole load of Trinidad distillers, very old Trinidad distillers. Then you've got some of the 2021 and the Flagons of Navy rum. It's, I mean, it pretty much is the most complex blend in the world <laughs> that, uh, where you still have the full transparency of what's going on inside. Now, 2022, again, I want to think about if you were, if you were the one creating the blend, if you were trying to put this together, if you had, you know, all these different casts, all these different flavors, how do you start? How do you begin? And again, like cooking or like painting, you generally have an idea of what it is you're trying to make before you start putting things together. Like if you're cooking, most of you probably don't just start throwing random ingredients in the pan and just hoping for the best. Maybe some of you do. I don't know how you cook, but usually you have an idea. Oh, I want to cook this dish and you put in the right ingredients for that dish and hopefully it tastes good. Or if you were painting something, you would probably have an idea of if you're painting a landscape or a mountain or a tree or whatever it was. And you choose the colors, you choose the ideas for that. When you're blending, it's it's really a similar idea. You're not just throwing stuff together and hoping it works. You have an idea. I want it to taste like this. I want these flavors. I want these effects in the mouth when I put it together. So then you're looking for the individual cask, the individual ingredients and how you can put those together and what's going to give you that final picture okay now 2022 is interesting because Sekinda opened up a bottle of 1970s barbon core from haiti and told our blender make this <laughs> and ollie said we can't <laughs> and and Sekinda was like try um and then he was like well it's never going to taste exactly like it because you know they don't make that rum anymore. But what are the flavor notes you're getting in the 1970s barbon core that we could try and recreate with modern day rums now? And one of the notes that they got in this very old barbon core was this kind of dusty chocolate, almost like cocoa powder kind of note. And he's like, right, that that's a flavor that you don't see in a lot of rums today. So how can we harness that so he started looking for casts that get, get, uh, gave you that flavor then they started opening up you know some other old bottles and we're like okay what are what are some of these older styles of flavors that we don't typically see in modern day rums and what can we blend to create a rum that tastes like it could have come from the 60s or 70s so this was kind of the philosophy with 2022 and and i certainly that dusty chocolate note for me always really comes through when i try this a lot of people, and this is a good one to go back to the 50th anniversary if you've got both there. <clears throat> a lot of people 
if you like the 50th, you'll love the 2022. They're, for me, these are like very close brothers in the lineup of the Master Blenders. 50th maybe has a little bit of a, of a richer top note to it for me. Whereas the 2022 has this real you know, dark chocolate earthiness to it, which is lovely as well. And obviously each year we're adding to the previous year. So we're adding even more layers and layers and layers and layers of complexity. It's almost like creating your own mother broth that's now been going for, well, now five years as of this year. But each year we're adding layers this edition to this. Has pepperi notes? Like, yeah, me, I mean... Well, there wasn't, yeah. pre previous ones, there wasn't uh, pepperi notes, but here I can smell like uh, freshly granted uh, black pepper yeah. i could see that yeah absolutely i think you know and and just remember with tasting notes with what you smell what you taste that there's never any wrong answer you know there's never anything that's if if you smell it if you can taste it you know everyone's palate is unique everyone's palate is slightly different um so yeah so you should never never look at someone's tasting notes or the tasting notes from a company and think, oh, I'm I'm getting it wrong. Whatever you taste is that's that's awesome, you know? And and some people are very sensitive to certain flavors or spices or other things. So but I always find it interesting when someone picks up a flavor because I wouldn't have thought of black pepper. But I can definitely see that spice. I can definitely see you know, now I'm thinking about spices. I'm thinking of a little cinnamon in there and even maybe some cloves or some, you know, there, there's definitely some spicy notes in there as well. So, um, very nice. Okay, so that's our 2022. Now we're going to pour some 2023. Now, from the 2022 onwards, basically it never gets any simpler than that the 50th and the 2021 are the only simple blends we have in that we could fit the whole blend on the back label uh from 2022 ollie never really looked back after this and part of the reason was by by creating these super blends for each country it kind of gave him a lot more uh freedom in a way to to be able to really sort of perfect each region and then and then play with that and give that a little uh you know balance with the other with the other casks he was looking at it's much harder when you've only got eight or nine casks to then go okay i hope they all like each other you know when you focus on each region first you can really make something special and then it's just getting those balance between those so 2023 we see a similar similar kind of thing let me pull that up for you now um it's 2022 2022 won a lot of awards which is always good as well um but yes and 2022 i think is arriving in poland soon if it hasn't already so in the next uh we think by the end of august you should have 2022 23 maybe 24 as well so stay tuned um so 2023 we went it's heavy on the Guyana 31.5 percent but interestingly the combination of the Barbados Jamaica Trinidad and the Grenada for the first time this year really stands out for me as as the fruit really comes through with that chocolate from the Guyana the perpetual blend is quite heavy that and Remember, that's last year's, that's 2022 coming into 23. So almost 20% in there. Um, here's the full blend breakdown. See, now it gets even more complex because some of the components here are actually the super blends from the previous year. So to when you see things like Barbados, Master Blenders Reserve 2022, you have to go back to 22 and go, right, what was in the Barbados? Okay, yeah, Mount Gay, Foursquare, and that. And then that came through into this, but we also aged it for another year. So it's, it's, it's blends within blends and getting even more complex. Um, now, a lot of Demerara distillers, some West Indies rum, some Foursquare, some Mount Gay from the previous year, 
some Long Pond, Clarendon, New Yama from the previous year, some Worthy Park. Uh, first time we put Worthy Park in. And actually, if you notice, this is a tiny little geek detail, but just something that you might find interesting. So when I started doing the masterclasses for Black Top Finest Caribbean, we bought all of the individual components of that blend so that we could do the masterclasses. But to buy those components, we had to buy about 10,000 liters of each blend. So we then, obviously, I do a lot of masterclasses, but I don't do 10,000 liters worth at the moment. So we put some aside for the masterclasses and the rest we put into casks, which we then kept aging in Scotland. So where you see components like that Worthy Park, three years tropical aged plus three years continental, that's the same component that was in Finest Caribbean, just aged for an extra three years in Scotland. So sometimes you'll see, when you see a couple of the younger ones, um, you'll, you'll sometimes notice, so, okay, that's the same component. Uh, same with the four square, five year tropical age plus three years continental. That will be the component from Finest that we've just kept on aging in Scotland as well. Uh, minor point, but just something interesting if you want to geek out about it. Uh, you may notice as well in the Trinidad, we've got some 10 cane for the first time. Now, 10 cane, if you haven't had it before, uh, was a project on Trinidad that Moat Hennessy did once upon a time where they tried to make cane juice rum. Um, they folded the brand after a few years. But it turns out if you age 10 cane casks for a really long time, they taste absolutely delicious. So we managed to get this 15 year old cask of 10 cane. Brilliant. Um, and you you might see a couple of independent bottlers like Holmes Key just did the 10 cane bottling as well. Really delicious. If you haven't tried 10 cane before, really, really cool. Um, the Ironically, the rum that they released on the brand, very light, very simple, very, you know, it's okay, but nothing, nothing extravagant. If they just waited a few years and released some of these casks, 10 game would be much more famous. Um, some Grenada rum as well. So the 28 year Grenada rum in there, because why not? Um, Ollie, when he was doing this, wanted a citrus note to accent in the blend. And the Grenada rum gave him the citrus note that he couldn't get on any of the other casks. So that's why he added Grenada on this one. Again, more Navy rum flagons. We always add a handful of Navy rum flagons into it. And if you haven't seen the Navy rum flagons outside of this before, um, if you add me on Instagram, you'll see uh, we do some videos where we actually open up some of the Navy rum flagons and we test ABVs and we you know try them and stuff. And it's quite an interesting little thing. So um, by all means, jump on there as well. Uh, so 23 chocolate fruit for me it's almost like chocolate raisins kind of notes coming through on this mm. it's so good <laughs> Mitch, <laughs> yeah uh, I, I have a question about this Royal Navy Ram blend yes. so it is uh, not, not, not blend in other way is it a blend from the different flagons or just taken some 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 uh, rams with, with from from some uh, flagons and it, it is blend already in in the flagons yeah so it will be a it will be these yeah. flagons going in mm -hmm. but the flagons themselves are blends yeah so, so they're world they're world blends that the navy did for the mm -hmm. 150 160 years yeah. so so technically if you add any flagon you're adding all of these blend. blends mm -hmm. and then if you start adding five six seven eight flagons then you're getting different and they're not always the same year right so in 2024 i went down and we we looked at the flagons and we did the same batch so they're the 2024 has all flagons from 1954. So we know roughly 1953, 1954, mm -hmm. that kind of era of flagons. But if you take something like last consignment, as we do at the end, that's actually a blend of flagons from the fifties and 1970. So it's two big differences in era. And then we're blending that together. 
so uh so yeah so we we call it a blend because it is it's always a always a blend if you're adding a flagon thank you pleasure what do we think of 23 good happy tasty very different um, very different right yeah yeah it's this more is... like woody less esters than the previous edition mm -hmm. yeah yeah i think a lot of that that chocolate you still and and this is the thing right again esters are all fruit smells so a lot of these flavors you're getting they are still esters but the esters we often associate as being or oh, esters that we like are these burnt rubber these acetones these very volatile esters but that's not always the case so a lot of these flavors that you're getting that they, they are esters again it's just not not the burning rubber esters maybe that you'd get on <laughs> something like more like the 21 mm. delicious um we should do a vote at the end as well i don't know if it's a a way to do it we should have a vote and see which one is your favorite because i think that's one of the interesting things of doing these tastings side by side is that you see how different each year becomes and how much variance you get. Whereas I think a lot of people, they just see it as a white label and they don't really pay attention to the year or the difference in flavors. So I'd, I'd be really interested to find out at the end what which one you guys prefer the most. Um, again, keep adding your notes and questions in the comments and I will keep reading them and translating what I can. Um, so that brings us to 2024. So this is our uh, new which, baby. Which, oh, yeah. Which, uh, before we go to 2024, I have a question. Mm. Yeah. Um, how, how many samples, how much time do you or anyone in Elixir uh, needs to make a new blend and do you compare the new blend with the previous one to make uh, all of them as a complex you know what i mean because mm -hmm. uh, every everyone is different mm -hmm. 50th anniversary is different uh, 2021 is different 22 23 24 uh, and now I'm curious, uh, what, is, what will be the blend of 2025, for example, or 26? Of course, mm -hmm. I know you, maybe you don't know it, maybe you can tell, it, tell, tell this now, yeah? But how the process looks like mm. to make a new blends? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So it's, it's probably quite different now to when we first started with the 50th anniversary, because when we started with 50th anniversary, we only had really a, a handful of rum casks that we were starting out with. And as Black Tot has grown and become more popular, um, we've started investing more and more into buying more rum casks. And we're very lucky that, you know, Sikinder Singh was very successful and, uh, sold whiskey exchange to focus purely on elixir distillers and to focus on brands like black tart and the distilleries building so um so ollie had a lot of freedom to to really have his pick and and, and get a a good number of rum casks so as we've got more casks we've had more options to play with you know we've had more freedom with the blending of, of what to do um i can only give you sort of like uh sort of the the insights i can give you from 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 my experiences there but for for instance this year so when, when we were coming to blending the 2024 we knew we were going to go barbados heavy so the first thing that ollie focused on was creating a barbados super blend and, and looking at the barbados bit first um I went to visit him in Scotland and he had a, about two or three boxes of cask samples from about 30, 40 different Barbados casks. 
And so the first job would be to taste every one of those samples and go, okay, this one does this, this one does this, this one does this, this one does the same as this one, this one's slightly in between the two. And you're sort of, for me at least, you're kind of creating this flavor map of what does each cask bring to the table? Are there any outliers? Is there something very extreme or very light or something that might throw the blend off if we put it in? Maybe in a good way. Maybe you want something a bit more extreme. So you sort of first build up this flavor map of every option that you have out there so you know what they all do. And then from there, you can look back at your notes and you can go, okay, right, I think these casks will come well together. These will, these ones will balance each other out. This will add a little bit more spice. This will add a little bit more fruit, you know, and you're sort of, you're basically building this, this, this painting, you're building this tapestry of, of, of all the flavors that you've got to work with. That's just for one Island. And then you're doing the same process with Jamaica, same with Guyana, same with Trinidad. So the whole time you're thinking, what was this idea you had of the flavors you were trying to create? You're then looking at the ingredients to see if that's even possible. You might start blending it and creating it. And then you go, actually, that doesn't work. We now need to take it in another direction. So Ollie and Sakinda will have a lot of meetings where they'll taste the blend through its iterations. And they'll, they'll say, okay, this, no, we want to do more of this or this was a good idea, but it doesn't work. Let's try this, you know? And so there might be these little adjustments. Um, it's very rare that you just put something together and straight away it works, you know? Uh, even with Finest Caribbean, they, they did 26 different blends before they were happy. And then they went back to blend number 19. So they actually did a few extra and then went, actually, no, let's go back. So, and that was, that was just with four different rums, you know? Um, so it's, it's, it's very tough. You know, when, when they say blending is an art form, it's, it's really true, right? Cause you've got to know when to stop. You've got to know when you've added enough or, or when, you know, stop messing with it, just leave it as it is. Uh, you've got to know when, okay, you've hit that certain point, but you've also, and this is the crazy part, when you first blend a rum together, it does not taste like how it's going to taste in three to six months time. Because when you marry alcohol together, alcohol doesn't like each other. The flavors don't marry. They don't sit well together. It's like if, you know, you put three new housemates together, they're not instantly going to get along. They might do after a few, few weeks of getting to know each other, but Initially, there's going to be some tension. They've got to work it out, you know, and alcohol is kind of the same. You know, it takes a little while for these flavors to marry. So you're then going, right, it tastes good now, but how will that taste in three to six months? And then that's just experience and that knowledge and understanding of how those flavors will integrate and develop. Also, you might have had a sample at two years and then by the time you get to it it's three years so how has that changed in the barrel you know between 20 years to 22 years you know has it got over over oaked has the wood taken over and has it gone too far has there been extra angel share has the barrel itself changed you know everything's constantly moving and this again you know i always talk about cooking as a good example you can have the perfect recipe for a dish you make it and you go, it needs more salt. It needs more spice. It needs more this. You're, you're tasting, you're adjusting, you're tasting, you're adjusting, you're tasting, you're adjusting. And then you go, okay, that's enough. Serve it. It's not going to get any better, you know? Okay. Okay. I, I, I'm asking about that because I did already some blends and mm -hmm. I think is it's a hard work you know people think that's oh, all yeah. great this is a fun no not at all so mm -hmm. so um uh, and, and sometimes and i'm just curious um is it possible in this specific situation because sometimes when uh, mm, uh when the when when the movie is is making 
and uh, uh, the guy who, who makes the movie do the uh, two different parts of the movie in the same time. Mm -hmm. And I'm sometimes I'm thinking that maybe uh, when you did a 2024 edition, maybe in the same time you did a 2025, and in the next few months you you add some new something new to you know to to change something and mm -hmm. uh, of course i know if you can't say it you just can't say it but uh, but uh, I, I think i could do that and it mm -hmm. could work Maybe. so so the first first three or first three years four years it was really uh every year was just that year we were just looking at okay we might have an idea of what we might want to do next year but we were too too new into the process and and we still had very small uh you know supplies of of rum cast to really play with and really to be able to plan too much into the future um it's changed a lot this year because uh when Sikinda sold the whiskey exchange, uh, he also uh, got the Tormore distillery. Um, and so we actually have a, a distillery in Speyside now, a whiskey distillery, unfortunately, but it's still a very lo lo lovely distillery. <laughs> and it's the first time we've ever had our own warehouse space in Scotland. So we've got, uh, you know, four or five warehouses there. And one of the warehouses at Tormore is dedicated to rum, which is very exciting for me um full of rum casks it's amazing uh there's probably more rum in that warehouse than anywhere else in scotland right now which is really exciting and because of that we're now, now able to plan a little bit further into the future so so yeah we're um ollie's definitely already looking at 2025 now for sure um we decided this year as well to release it a little bit earlier so we're releasing we used to release master blenders always on the 31st of july for black top day we then realized that everyone wanted to have the new bottle on black top day so we've we as of this year we're releasing from the 1st of july to give everyone a bit of time to get it and to be able to get their bottle so you can hopefully soon in poland we'll also have it for you there as well yeah. um but let's have a let's have a little look at 2024 because this will give you a sort of an idea of of uh, a slightly new direction we're taking, uh, which may or may not apply to 2025. But you'll have to uh, <laughs> you'll have to decide on that yourself. Um, so this year we decided to have like a, a hero country, and this year we focused on Barbados as the the star of the show. So. 60% of the blend is Barbados, 25% of the blend is then Trinidad, 5% Jamaica, 5 Guyana, 5 Perpetual Blends. Now, straight away, when you look at these blend percentages and you look at the, the islands they're coming from, this should tell you, okay, this is going to be a fruitier, brighter, uh, slightly lighter style uh, compared to the others not just because it's so heavy on the Barbados and the Trinidad, but also because it's so light on the Guyana, because we've always had a much heavier uh, amount of Guyana in the blend. And Guyana, as you know, gives you that rich, heavy, treacly, heavy molasses kind of notes. Whereas by dropping that down, it allows the fruit from the Barbados, the Trinidad, the Jamaica to really shine through. Here is the blend breakdown. Um, so in there, you've got four square West Indies, a 22 year old Mount Gay pot still. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, some very old Trinidad distillers rum, some 26 year old Carony. Again, what a crazy thing to have in a blend. New Yarmouth, Clarendon, Long Pond, uh, some 20 year old, <laughs> 21 year old diamond, um, and some eight year diamond as well. Then a smaller amount of the perpetual blend this year. So we put only 5% total from last year's rum and from the Navy flagons. It was eight flagons of rum that we put in the end this year. Um, and as I say, if you look on our Instagram, you can see the actual flagons that we opened up this year to add to 2024. Uh, we did it in January in Scotland. So it's very, very cold. You can basically see me like wrapped up <laughs> in a scarf as we're doing it because it was freezing. Um, 
this for me is the fruitiest, juiciest rum that we've done so far in the master blenders. I think it's really uh, my my colleague Chanel described it like uh, biting into a juicy pineapple, and I thought that was just the best description of this rum. Um, mm. Hey, uh, a quick here. question, Helen. Uh, a quick question. It's just like interesting for me. Why Caroni's thirteen years? So did someone take it out of the wooden cast to like the steel? Why it's not still kept in the wooden cast? Like why it's not still aged? I'm I'm curious. Ah, uh, so no, so these ages that you see, if you notice at the top, it says tropical aging and continental aging. So you actually got to add these two numbers together to get the total time in the woods. So 13 years aged in Trinidad, then another 13 years aged either in Liverpool, Scotland. The Caroni casts typically are Sakindas that he bought years ago. So they've been in Scotland mostly. Um, so yeah, so the total okay, age of yeah, that I, Caroni is yeah, 26 that years. Sense. That only makes sense. I feel a bit stupid, although I think it might yeah. make sense uh, to like another column like the total age well it's not really like it doesn't add up like someone just reads the first column six years he's not looking at the next column so i think i might be not the only person missing the the continental aging kind of maybe makes sense for you to add to this chart total age tropical age and continental by mm. uh yeah um yeah, possibly. It's, it's always hard to know, isn't it, with all these things, because it's uh, the more the more transparent you make it, the more confusing it can be <laughs> it can become. Um, but yeah, that that's that's how we've laid it out just to because we want you to have full transparency on where the rum grew up, because obviously, as we know, tropical and continental aging are so different. So we think it's important that you have the, the distinction between the two. Um. Nice to see you on the call, though. I'm missing, I'm missing your gummy bears, and <laughs> I think these would make delicious gummy bears. By the way, <laughs> I was spreading the gummy bear last night earlier, so I was like dialing, <laughs> getting to my apartment, so I couldn't be there on time. But you know, one day maybe I'll make it to the uh, to the Amsterdam, or I guess like sooner or later you will be back in London. Absolutely, I look forward to it. Um, so that's our 2024. This is our new baby. Um, as I say, I, I think the fruitiest, the brightest, the probably the, the easiest drinking out of the, the five master blenders for, for me. Um, very different style to, to the other years that we've done. Um, but I'm really curious. Uh, um, I'd love to know, as I say, what, what, uh, do you, are you able to do a vote on here, um, Chris? Do you know how to do it? They still have the votes. Once again, once again. I'll, I'll leave that leave that with you to figure it out when we do it because it'd be interesting to see what your favorites are. But um, but I hope I hope regardless that you see how much we're changing the blends every year, how much we're changing the flavors every year. Um, we really want everyone to be unique and. You know what? Some years you're going to go, I don't like that as much. And that's OK. That's fine. <laughs> like we want it to be unique and different every year. And hopefully, you know, if you're if you're trying to build a rum collection like I am, you know, that you'll find a space and a, a place for every every one of these additions. And as I say, in Poland, you're pretty much the only country left that can do it because <laughs> because no one else can get 50th anniversary. So everyone else who's discovering Black Tot now they're screwed. They can't find these old bottles. So you're still in a good place for that. Um, any questions at this stage before we go on to our final rum of the night? Depends what you ask. Depends what you ask. <laughs> All right. We ready for, are we ready for the beautiful of this beautiful rum we are able to put to not waste it how do you mean so like Shishek gave us a little bit less so i think this is something really really special so i don't want to waste this precious liquor and i would like to have it in my time capsule or something like this 
You were listening uh, to you now, it's 1,000 euros a bottle now. 1,000 yeah. euros? Yeah. Yeah. It's a, yeah. So maybe just so, one drop. One <laughs> every one year. So it will last for maybe 10, maybe 20, it depends. Hi, Piotr. <laughs> We know, it. and and this is this is one of the things that I I will say, especially when you have sample bottles like this. Well, like just drink them, just <laughs> just get into it because um, they don't get any better with age. Once they've been decanted, once the air's got to them, once you start getting and halfway down, they are down, fourteen years old right now, or even they are older. Well, so well. I'll go. I'll go into it. I'll tell you the whole whole breakdown. But I, I mean, this was a a fresh bottle that Chris just decanted for you guys in the last few weeks since I since I saw you at Romlov uh, Festival Poland. So uh, he asked if we could do something very special for you guys. And again, it's not something we would normally do, but we wanted to to do something really out there for you guys. So let's have a little look at last consignment. And uh, we will look at the rum in there. Okay, so our final rum of the evening. Now I have one rule. We have to all drink this together. So you can pour it out now, but I don't want you to drink it until we do a little toast together. So I actually don't know if I've got any last consent left because I think I've got a drop. <laughs> I've, got, I've got barely nothing. I've just we just took our the last bottle that I had. This is <laughs> you you have you have more last consignment than I do, right? <laughs> it's been a busy month, black top month always drains my uh, resources. So <laughs> um so last consignment. Uh what is it, first of all? So I told you before that the Navy were buying rum from all around the world and blending it together. I showed you these blending vats earlier on. Now, these blending vats are the small blending vats, 4,000 gallons, so about 16,000 litres. Um, the biggest ones were about as big as the size of an Olympic swimming pool, okay? We have very different Olympics. Um, Why and they were like 4.391? It's not metric. That gallons, why it's so random? Because the old days, <laughs> and that's so and that's what they did. Was so they built this person and then for fifty years or how much? Sorry, one at one at a time. Sorry, pa Pavel, what was your question? No, like, I wondered, like, did they build this person and then measure it? Like, like, what? What's quite how possibly does it make sense? How does it make sense? Yeah, quite quite possibly. You you'd quite possibly build it and then work it out afterwards, or or they had a certain measurement that they were they're working towards, and then you had to get an accurate figure. They might have a fill line which they went up to, which they worked. Again, if you remember the world, well, no one here probably remembers the world before decimals, but the world before decimals seems like a crazy place because none of the numbers made sense at all. So I mean, it still is the point of it. Remember, we're talking about a country that just did Brexit. So, you know, they've they <laughs> like they had some crazy crazy figures. Anyway, regardless, that's not the important part. The important part is you had 51 blending vats, uh giant blending vats, open top wooden vats, and they connected the pipe uh pipes in between the vats about a third of the way up. And the idea was that you could top up any of these vats and eventually all the rum would blend together. So they started this, we believe, early 1800s, around 1804, 1805. They finished it 166 years later in 1970. So for 166 years, they're just topping up the vats, blending it together. And then Black Tot Day comes. They put all the rum into the flagons. 40 years later, we buy the flagons and we bottle it to make Black Tot last consignment. So there's only, we only made 3,000 bottles of this. We have about 300 bottles left. Um, and anything that's out there now, that's it. Once this is gone, we can't make this again. Um, we do have more flagons, but we don't have the same ratio of flagons to make this blend. 
because this was a blend of flagons from 1954 and from 1970, which were two very distinct styles. So what is it? It's a world blend of rum from distilleries all around the world, Barbados, Guyana, Jamaica, Trinidad, Australia. But we also have records of some rum being made in Singapore in the early 1800s. And we have a flagon that said Singapore on the top. We had, uh, you know, records of the Navy buying Martinique rum, Cuban rum at certain points. Really was a world blend. Um, when we look at the aging, some of it would have been in the Caribbean. Some of it would have been on the ships. Some of it would have been in cold climates. It would have been a real mix. Raw material, yes, we think mainly molasses. But back in the day, you would have also had distilleries working with rums and working with more cane juice and syrup as well, or doing a mixture of raw materials, so not just the molasses. Um, pot and column still, predominantly pot still though, but then later with Carony coming into the blend in the 1900s, Carony was one of the biggest suppliers to the Royal Navy. And even the story of Carony, you've got to think, when Carony started having financial troubles, it was after 1970 when the Navy went dry, when they stopped buying a lot of this rum. A lot of the Guyanese distilleries that closed down happened in the 70s, 80s, after the Navy stopped, stopped buying millions of litres of this rum. So Navy really affected a lot. Um, again, we don't chill filter, we don't add any sugar to this. Um, and the cask type, this is an interesting bit as well to note. We think of everything today being pretty much as standard bourbon casks. Maybe occasionally there'll be a special release of a port cask, a sherry cask, a different expression. But the stock standard is bourbon cask today. In the 1800s, 1900s, that wasn't the case. You would have had sherry cask, wine cask, all different types of wood. So when you smell this rum, when you look at the color of this rum, it's so, so different to everything we ever have because the production methods back then do not exist today. Even if we wanted to, we could not recreate this rum. It's a moment of history. It's a, it's a quite literally liquid history. You know, it's something that is a, a moment of time that was captured. And luckily we don't know why, but because they didn't put this rum into casks after Black Top Day, because they put it into the flagons, it preserved the rum exactly as it was. If they put it into a barrel, it would have evaporated, it would have got over-oaked, it would have changed. But because they put it into the flagons, it's almost like they put it into these little time capsules. You know, it really preserves the rum exactly as it would have been. And so what, what you're about to drink is, you know, what they had on a ship 54 years ago today. So we are going to uh, do a little toast. Some of you may know this toast. If you don't, yeah. we're going to learn it together. Now, we're going to break all of the Zoom rules here in a second, because I'm going to ask all of you to turn your videos on, but also to unmute yourselves. But you got to behave, OK? <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, the whole thing turns into mayhem. And I know it's Poland, so it can very quickly happen. Oh, hi, all you new faces. Hi, it's good to see you. We missed you. Right. Okay. So everyone get your videos on. Unmute yourselves now. And what we're going to do is you're going to repeat after me. So I'll say the line. You say it after me. And you have to do the arm movements as well. Okay. Very important. Is everyone ready? Yeah. 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 Ready. Okay. All right. Okay. So here we go. There are tool ships. There, there are dark ships. 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 And there are small ships. And there are small, and there are ships. small ships. And there are ships that sail the sea. And, and there, there are ships, ships that sail, sail the, the sea. sea. But the best ships, but the best the ships, ships, ships are friendships. Are friendships. Are friendships. So here's to you and me. Here's, here's to you, here's to you and me. me. Cheers, everyone. Cheers. 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 Uh, Isn't that delicious? Yeah, it is. Great. That's uh, 
that's that's why I took the job. If you ever wonder why I <laughs> why why I signed the contract with Black Top Rum, it was that rum. I tasted that. And I just it's any excuse one. to drink that. But is it just... your favorite out of all Black Top? I'm not sure if it like is it better than all the oh, master oh, selection. Oh, and oh. also, like I think there are there's a Black Top that you never mentioned. There was like the flagon rum that was like the next edition, like the kind of older version of rum, oh, yeah, right? Yeah. Hold on, so I'll just ask everyone else to mute themselves again so I can hear. What what was the last thing you asked, Pavel? Uh, yes, I, I get like in different micro microphones, but, yeah. but I think there is a black dog that you kind of never mentioned that's like older flag and rum, right? There were more than one flag and edition. No, well, no, so we, we did one bottling of a uh, black top 40 year old, uh, yeah, but it yeah, wasn't exactly. from. It wasn't from the flagons. Uh, it was from casks of a 1975 Port Morant, uh, which was distilled at the Eiflet Distillery. Um, we don't really <coughs> talk about it because it's all sold out. Uh, but if you do come to Amsterdam, And you can you can still find the occasional bottle. I just saw they had it on Spirit Academy today. Um, it's about two thousand euros on Spirit Academy. They, wow. I think, I think they've got an offer on, and it's two thousand euros with the offer. <laughs> but not Black Top, to be to be honest, to be honest, I thought about this bottle to our tasting tonight, uh, but I decided to to keep it, leave it for the next meeting with us. So. It's, so, so, <laughs> this yeah, this one might be harder to provide because uh, we so, are you we, crazy? so ah. we don't have any bottles of this left. Um, so you said that we can come to your house. So tell me that. Also, yeah. <laughs> it's so this this one's a really interesting rum. If you've had very old Guyanese rums, or if you've had any rum that's aged for forty years or more, it's super chewy it's super complex it's very tannic very heavy 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 rum um for me it's it's one of the most interesting examples of of a very heavy style of guyanese rum uh it's also the only black top that isn't a blend of different countries uh it was kind of because guyana was such a the heart of the top we decided to release this as a, a sort of one-off edition there were only 300 bottles made and it is one of the oldest Guyanese rums in the world. Um, it's it's really tough to say. I mean, from one on one hand, I'd say, yes, obviously, it's great to have the oldest Guyanese rum that you can find and, and try it. It's fascinating. Um, but honestly, flavor wise, if if and if I'm being completely upfront with you, if, if I had the choice of buying a one bottle of this or two bottles of last consignment i would do the last consignment all day long i think it's such a as a as a blend as a flavor profile for me i think last consignment is so balanced and it really shows you the advantage of doing a blend versus one very old rum um if you like the old guyanese style the 40 is fantastic but for me flavor wise last consignment is really just incredible, you know. Like, and, uh, if you were to yeah. get like a double for free, would you flavor wise just take, uh, assuming that all the master, uh, master blender selection, master yeah. editions were sold out, would you like flavor wise, assuming none of them are uh, all you can buy a lot of anymore, would you really go for last of time as the, your favorite state wise? I, I think it's, it's different things and it depends what you're looking for because. I think in terms of the the flavors Ollie's putting together with Master Blenders Reserve, I mean, I think they're incredible. I think they're the best, you know, I, I know I work with the company, but I think they're some of the best blends in the planet right now. And, you know, for me, having all of them and being able to geek out about what's in there and look at the recipes and really sort of break it apart for me, it's, it's fascinating as a rum nerd. Um, I think Last Consignment has, you know, a historical aspect to it, which there are very few rums in our lifetime which are ever going to have that weight to it, you know? Like, 
we, but you really okay. stated it before, so like once you already are part of this history, now I would say you navigate my plan. I don't know. I mean, for me, when whenever we taste any spirit, we're we're sort of locking back into a moment in time or a, a memory or a feeling or a place. And so for me, when when you drink last consignment. Flavor wise, a lot of people say they prefer Master Blender's Reserve. They think Master Blender's Reserve has like, you know, a lot of variety and a lot of different uh, kicks to it, and and much, you know, for them it can be a much more interesting flavor wise. But for me, the historical aspect of Last Consignment is is irreplaceable. You know, like we talk about some of these old Bellier bottlings and the Skeldon seventy three and these, you know, the Albion eighty six, and we we geek out about some of these very old bottlings, but even, even those as popular as they are, as amazing as they are, and, and as much as I'd love to have them all in my collection, uh, you also don't have that like, oh, this was a rum that was served for, on ships for 239 years and blended for 160 years and put in flagons for 40 years. Like it's, it's really a rum that honestly, I think if more people knew about it, it would be gone like that you know but we're still small we're luckily more people don't know about us so there's still a few bottles left but it's um i don't outside of something like the harewood house bottlings like there's not for, there's not very many rums in the world that i think have the history attached to it that last consignment has and and it's a crazy thing but because it's rum it's still relatively affordable and i know a thousand euros is a still a huge amount of money to pay on on anything for and for a bottle of rum especially but if this was a whiskey tasting and i was talking to whiskey people and i said i've got a blend of whiskey here that's made from distilleries that don't exist anymore started in 1804 blended for 166 years put into flagons for 40 years served to the royal navy uh, and is impossible to make anymore if that was a whiskey I don't know how many zeros you'd add on to the end of the price, but it would be it would be priceless, you know. But because it's rum, it's a thousand euros. Okay, it's still a lot of money, but compared to what you see in other spirit categories, honestly, this is the best time ever to build a rum selection, other than ten years ago, which was definitely better. But now yeah. is the best time before it goes up any higher. Exactly. Last question before Chris, uh, Chris like mutes and kicks me out. You mentioned you still have flagons, so there might be kind of a different version of last consignment coming from a different flagon from. We we do have some flagons. We don't have enough for a very big release. Um, if it were up to me, which it isn't, but in a dream world, um, what I would love to do is like a a set where we do vintage flag and releases from different eras so you could try what the navy blend tasted like in 1953 versus 1954 1969 versus 1970 um just do like some small 200 mil bottles or something we do it to arrange i'm going to keep saying it with the hope that one day we might do something like that um but for now uh, you know the the handful of flagons we have we're we're adding a little bit each year into master blender's reserve because it makes it taste better and we think it's a nice tie back to the original navy rum to always add some flagons in we won't be able to do it forever so i don't know when that will stop but um but yeah right now we're very we're very lucky that we have you know we're basically the custodians of this very very historical rum and we've just got to try and do the the best we can to make sure that people know about it, people respect what it what it was and what it is. And uh, and as long as we have it in our lifetimes, you know, you you got to think your your kids, your grandkids, will be like, did you get to try that run? <laughs> like, yeah, we did some random online session and we talked. <laughs> we got to try this thousand euro run. They're like, that run doesn't exist anymore, you know. And you know, you you're really tasting something that. And I know, I know we're small. I know it seems crazy, but when we talk about these old Velia bottlings, these Skeldons, these albums, these things like that, when they were getting released, they were 80, 90 pounds a bottle. They weren't, they weren't crazy prices, you know? Now you pay two, three grand for them. 
and you, you, sometimes these bottles we don't appreciate until they're gone. Like Carony. No one cared about Carony a few years ago. Now, hundreds of pounds a bottle. But back back then, you could have bought all the Carony you wanted. It wouldn't have cost you much. So, so yeah. The story I, Lucas said, like, how it was the cheapest uh, run that, like, kind of teenagers in Italy were doing as a shot because they were, like, kind of the cheapest alcohol in the bar. There you go. So, you know, sometimes for, for me, like the dream is always you find that rum or you find that bottle of something really special. And you think, I think one day that's going to be something really sought after or something really special. Like you can taste it. You can sense it. You know, for me, 50th anniversary is one of those bottles. I think in our lifetimes, you know, it's already sold out. I think in our lifetimes, we're going to hit a point where people are going to be like, trying to get these crazy bottles and you can buy it for a hundred pounds you know it's um i think last consignment it's a thousand now i think when that's sold out it will double triple whatever i and i don't say that from a collector's point of view i don't say it because i've never sold a bottle of rum in my life i never intend to unless unless things go really wrong and then i'll sell some bottles if, if i'm really stuck but i just love the idea of buying a, a bottle of rum now that in 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, you know, we get to open, it'll be priceless, but what an experience that will be to share a bottle like that in 20, 30 years with your kids, with your grandkids, something that's like, this doesn't exist anymore, you know? Yeah, exactly. Uh, okay, guys, um, I think uh, we finished. Yeah. <laughs> We've only gone about half an hour oh, over time, we are, right? We are 25 <laughs> minutes after <laughs> my plans. So, um, so um, we have to, we have to, fast. we have to, uh, what? It's very fast for the regular. Uh, uh, Usually it's an hour late. Yeah, yes. <laughs> exactly. Not so bad, Tushek. Don't be so bad about this. Yeah, yeah, I had to get the comb. So, so yeah, so, so. Uh, <laughs> My uh, wife also called me and I said like, oh, we still have after party. Just wait, I will be home. I'm <laughs> after meeting, after meeting. Uh, so, um, yeah, Mitch, if it's, if that's all, uh, I want I to thank you very much. No, thank you. And, and so I just want to say thank you, all of you. I, I hope you've enjoyed tonight. I hope you've enjoyed the side by side of all of it. So it's this, this is not a tasting we've ever done and probably not a tasting we'll ever do again. So you guys really are part of something special here. And, um, you know, big thanks to, to Christoph, uh, to you for, you know, your your energy in building the Poland rum scene and for not letting me forget about this tasting is <laughs> it's the reason why we're doing it tonight. Um so, and please, I know I'm in touch with some of you, but if any of you want to stay in touch, uh, you've got my Instagram and the handle and stuff here. Just always feel free, drop me a message um, or take my email. It's mitch at blacktop.com. And any questions you ever have, always very happy to, very happy to help. We have some plans to visit Amsterdam this year. Uh, we have? So, yeah. So, so uh, expect us. Uh, some of us, uh, so uh, we'll be in touch with with this point, and uh, and yeah. So I hope we meet in the central of Amsterdam, maybe somewhere in Red Area District. <laughs> no, it's about, no, no, it's about so it's only about a five minute walk from where I am. So yeah, no problem, yeah. no problem. <laughs> <laughs> we we have to find some place to park a car, and and we go. We can go by foot, no problem. So. Uh, yeah, uh, Mitch, it was a pleasure, really. Thank you so much, guys. Thank uh, you. Uh, so thank you very much, and uh, and uh, and yeah, we see each other later. Yeah, later this year on the festivals. Oh yes, I look forward to it. Will, will anyone we, be at the German Rum Fest? Will you be in uh, Berlin? Some of us. Yeah. Yes, for sure, for sure, for sure, for sure. Uh, so I'm. Uh, oh, I'm working yeah, so... in Berlin. I'm coming to Berlin. So see you in Berlin. Nice, wonderful. Yes, so yeah, perfect. so and also I also I have some plans um to do some good tasting in Poland personally. So if you if you can come. Yeah, let's talk. Yeah. 
So that'd be really fun. But we would be in touch with the thing and and we will try to think something about that. Okay. Amazing. I look forward to it. Guys, thank you so much. Oh, thank uh, you, Mitch. Happy uh, happy Black Top Day for yesterday. And uh, <laughs> thank you so much for being Same here. Same to you. Pleasure, guys. Exactly. Thank you, Mitch. It was a pleasure. Cheers. You're awesome. Bye. And to all of you thank guys, you. We, we will see each other in the next five minutes. Uh, if anyone can. Yeah. Wonderful. You have, you have links in your emails. Mitch. Have have fun, guys. Bye Lovely bye. to see you. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. 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 Thank you.